chapter six test. So some of these I'm just going to describe and they're not written out. So here we have a solid going to a gas. So what will happen to the temperature? Well, energy is being absorbed by the molecules that went from solid to gas. So the overall temperature in the system is being spread out among more gas molecules, which means that the average energy per molecule is going down. And temperature is the average kinetic energy, which is the kind of energy we're talking about right now. And so the average kinetic energy across the board has gone down. So the temperature is going to go down a little bit. Presumably you have to put heat into this. I mean, the colder it gets, the less this is going to happen, the more that stuff is going to freeze, right? So the delta H is going to be endothermic. You have to put heat into this process. So that's a positive. However, very clearly, the delta S is a negative because we're going from solid to gas. And if this happens spontaneously, if it's a thermodynamically favored reaction going from solid to gas, then the total Gibbs free energy sign is a negative. Here we have a certain amount being burned, and we want the enthalpy of the reaction. So we, basically, we want the standard delta H, the delta H standard. And that's measured in kilojoules per moles of reaction, and that's very key. We need kilojoules and then we need moles of reaction. Now, the thing is, we don't know moles of reaction. What we can figure out from this is moles of chemical. Also, you're going to need the balanced reaction. Because we're using the heat capacity of the calorimeter, everything is taken into account. We know this calorimeter. We know this exact one. We've measured on it many times. We've de determined its heat capacity. We don't need the mass of the chemical. We know that if you push this container up one degree Celsius, it took 600 joules. So then two degrees up is 1,200 joules. So it took 1,200 joules to do this, and you use a tenth of a mole. And here's the last tricky thing. If you use two moles, you get one reaction. Or to put it opposite, because we're going to rate this per mole of reaction, if you run one mole of reaction, you use two moles. Now. One more time, for every one mole of reaction you run, you get to use two moles of this, so you get double this number. This is per moles of chemical methanol used. So you're going to get double that number, and you get this many joules per moles of reaction. For three, we want the delta H combustion, or essentially the delta H standard. So we're given the formation values for these chemicals, but you're going to need the balanced reaction. So we know it's being burned with oxygen because that's what we do. That's what combustion means. So I balance it out. And the other little trick to this is remember that the delta H formation of an elemental state is zero. That's why this doesn't appear in the table, and they don't need to, and it's, it's OK. So we're going to do products minus reactants each multiplied by the coefficient. So I'm going to take the value of H2O multiplied by 4 plus the value of CO2 multiplied by 3 minus the value of the fuel multiplied by 1. So I get minus 1200 minus 1200 plus 200. So that's negative 2200 kilojoules per mole. On four, as you could greatly suspect, having ammonium and nitrate in it, if you put this stuff in water, it dissolves great. So we dissolved it, and the temperature of the surroundings went down. So what can we say about the bond energies? Well, it went from solid to aqueous. And the other thing to remember is that aqueous means that the ions are surrounded by water molecules. So the NO3 minus is surrounded, and the water molecules will turn their hydrogen sides to the negative ion here. And that will be repeated, of course, three dimensionally all around it. And there will be a bond energy between the ions and the water. So we have the bond energy of the plus and minus ions together, and then them separately surrounded by water molecules, but the energy of the water overall decreased. 
So energy went into this process, which means that there was more energy contained in the bonds at the end than at the beginning. We know that the bond energies of the dissolved ions to water are greater than the bond between the solid cation and anion to start with. On five, what we have here is the distance between the nuclei of the bonded atoms, in this case, carbon and carbon. And here we have the potential energy of the bond. So if these were at 0.1 nanometer apart, center to center, then you know what they wouldn't be doing is sitting at the lowest potential energy. And that's what nature wants to do is release energy and achieve the lowest possible potential energy given the circumstances at hand, which is a phrase I've said before and I would write down if you need to. Nature wants to achieve the lowest potential energy given the current opportunities given to it. So it could be sitting at this potential energy, but that would mean it would have to back off from being at 0.1 nanometer apart, so that's what it'll do. So what can we predict? These atoms will actually separate a little bit more than being 0.1 nanometer apart so that they can achieve the lowest possible potential energy of that bond. For six, we have three so-called half reactions. I know there are three of them, so how can they be half? But that's the term I've heard. And together, they make up this reaction. So if the delta heats of formation of all these half reactions are X, Y, and Z, what is the overall delta H standard? Well, we're going to add up these values once we figure out how to flip and multiply these half reactions. The easy thing to do is look for chemicals that only belong on one side and are in one place only in here. So I'm going to look for P410. Yep, it's nowhere else, and it's on the wrong side. However, it is still one of these and one of those. So all I got to do is flip this one, and that makes this turn to minus X. On this one, I have H2O, and weirdly enough, that only appears in one place. However, it's on the wrong side, and it needs to turn into a 6. So I'm going to flip and multiply this by 6. That's a 6 multiplier. So this turns into negative 6Y. The tougher part is this one. Uh, the, the tougher part is this line, I think. The easy part of that one, though, I think, is the P4. Remember, this went over there, and I need to cancel it out because it's not in here, which means I need to multiply this line by 4. So that gives me 4Z. Don't change the sign because we didn't flip it. And then those all add up to be delta H standard. This isn't delta S standard because things have an inherent entropy without the change, they just have it. So this isn't delta. But we're gonna take this times the coefficient and subtract out this times the coefficient and that times the coefficient, which is what we've got here. And then we get this value. Evaporation of water clearly is thermodynamically favored in some cases, because you see it happening all the time. Though it clearly takes in energy and is endothermic, right? We know that because the hotter you get, the better it works. That's what endothermic reactions do. So how can this be favored if it's endothermic? Well, the answer is at certain temperatures, the transition from liquid to gas creates so much entropy that in the Gibbs free energy equation, the temperature times the delta S value is more negative than that is positive. Because remember, a positive change in entropy is favored. So this will be positive, but then that term turns negative. And I know this is positive. What we need to do is get a temperature high enough that this all turns more negative than that is positive when we get a negative delta G standard value, which means the reaction is favored at that temperature. Here again, we dissolve ammonium chloride in water. And again, the temperature dropped. So what are we able to say about delta H, delta S, and delta G? Well, here's the reaction. If it's favored and we watched it dissolve, then delta G is a negative. Delta S is clearly a positive because it went from solid to aqueous, plus it's split up. So not only is it dissolved and running around, not bonded to its neighbors, but the actual ions split up. So now this is in two parts. So for both reasons, the delta S is a positive. The fact that the water temperature went down means the energy was put into this. So the delta H for the reaction is a positive. It's endothermic.
on 10, well, I did it my way, which is I like to set it equal to zero because those inequalities drive me bananas. So I just say, well, the turning point is when delta G is zero because at one side it's negative, the other side it's positive. So we're going to put in our values. Do not forget to turn this to 0.2 kilojoules. If you leave it at 100 and 200, you will get a very wrong answer. Remember that this is usually reported in joules, whereas that's reported in kilojoules. So I converted this to kilojoules. This goes over. Um, then we have a negative negative. So let's just turn everything positive. We divide under, get 500 K is the temperature at which uh, G delta G is zero. So what are we looking for? Temperatures where the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. Now let's examine this for a moment. The delta S value was a negative, which is not thermodynamically favorable. So what I need to do is bring this value down. This one's working against me because since that's a negative and then we subtract, that turns into a positive. And this one is trying to keep the delta G from being in the thermodynamically favored range. So this is the breakover point from this being positive or negative and I want it to be negative, and I'm trying to keep this number small enough. So what I want is the temperature under 500 Kelvin. I want delta G standard for the whole reaction, and I don't have any delta G information in here, so I can't just do products minus reactions for the delta G data because I don't have any. What I'm going to need to do is use Gibbs free energy. So I have a hole in my information. I don't have delta H and I don't have delta S. So what I'm going to have to do is do products minus reactants for these individually, this column and this column individually. So I'm going to take the product times the coefficient minus the reactant times the coefficient and get the delta H overall for the reaction. Remember that the reason that that's a blank is that elemental states don't have delta H formation values. Same thing. For delta S, I'm going to take the products times the number minus the reaction times the number in front and get delta S. Then I can put both those values in here. Remember to use Kelvin temperature. Remember to turn this to kilojoules. And then we can uh, multiply, subtract, and get delta G standard overall. Read through all this. What can we figure out about the delta G value? Well, I can figure out delta G standard because I know delta H standard and delta S standard. And when I put them into the Gibbs free energy equation, I get delta G standard. So I'm going to put them in, solve for this. I get a positive value, which means this reaction is not thermodynamically favored and it wants to go left. Reactions that want to go left have too many products, they have too much on the right side. And that means that their denominator is too small, their numerator is too large for them to be K. Q is bigger than K. In here, really all you have to do is slap in the information we know. This is the free energy change. This is delta G standard implied because it's for the reaction. Anyway, um, the only real trick to this is remember that negative in the formula. That negative and that negative make a positive 25, and then we get these numbers. On 14, read through the information. They hand us Q. This much energy was released. There's Q. Except it was released, so the value is negative. We know that the total energy will be the energy heat-wise plus the work done. And the work is going to be the negative of the pressure it was working against in the expansion of the balloon or the container and so forth times the change in the volume. So here's the pressure it was working against. Don't forget the negative sign. And the change in the volume. Now, in this case, the volume decreases, so we get a negative value for the delta V. This just converts... Pascal, kilopascal liters to joules, because it turns out that a kilopascal liter is a joule. So the ratio is one to one, and we can just borrow this number and call it joules. Then we just add them up for the total change in energy. 
This math is a little complicated. The key here is knowing that the delta H units are kilojoules per mole. We already know kilojoules. What we need is moles, moles consumed. They told us grams of a chemical. And if you can't figure this out, I, I understand. I would take the grams, convert it to moles using this, except it's going to be upside down. And then remember that in the balanced reaction, for every one mole of reactions, you use two moles of that. So the amount that you get when you run one mole of reactions is double the amount that you get if you use one mole of chemical. You might have to hit pause and have a think. Every time you run this reaction once, you use two molecules of this. So when you find, I'll cover this over, kilojoules per mole for the chemicals, you have to double it for the amount that comes out for one mole of reactions. Now this can get a little confusing. The main point here is the total delta H value, which we found in the last problem, is equal to all the energy you have to put in to breaking up all the bonds and the reactants, minus, so to speak, all the energy released from forming all the bonds and the products. So what we're going to do is take the values in the table and assign positives to everything in the reactants and negatives to everything in the products. And remember, then they all add up to be the value of the number we already found. This is the overall total we know back from part A. So when they say two times four, it means stuff like, we know that there are four HC bonds in here in every molecule, except remember, look at the balanced reaction. We have to do that twice. There are two of these molecules. So re in reality, there are eight of the CH bonds, which means we have eight times that value from the table. And then we had to break up two of the CC bonds and then here's the unknown. This is X. And then we had to break up two of the C double bond O. Remember, there's only one C double bond O in every molecule, but we had to use two molecules. So that ends up being two of those. And it's not listed in the table because that's the unknown. But we're going to count that as a positive value. And the next little trick to notice is that that's two of these, two times that. And then we have eight negatives of the same thing which means in the end, when you add these up, we have six negatives of our unknown. I would punch this through and see if you can get it to be this. And remember, it's six unknowns. It, and then we have the value of the C double bond O bond for every single bond. The good news is the test writers have stopped asking this question in this way, and I think it's because they discovered that so many kids just didn't even know what they were asking. I mean, I didn't for a while. What they mean is that these two half reactions can be manipulated, flipped and multiplied and so forth, such that they create the overall reaction given at the top of the page or restated here. That's not obvious to me, and I got really lost, I admit. Good news is... They don't ask it that way. We'll just pretend that we understand that and that this is the final answer, and then it just becomes a Hess's Law exercise. These two half reactions must produce this. So let's see what we have. Funny enough, we only have water in one spot, so that's easy. It is on the correct side, but it needs to be multiplied by two. So the second line is multiplied by two, which means that the delta S standard value is multiplied by two from here to there. In line one, I see that this molecule only occurs in one spot in the whole set here. And it is supposed to be a two, but it's on the wrong side. So I will flip this end to end, which changes the sign of the delta S value. And then we can just add up the values and get the new overall value. Also, you could notice that we're supposed to have five O2s. And this has been multiplied by two, which is a six O2s. And then when we flip this one around, we get one O2 on the right, six O2s on the left, 
one on this side cancels out one on this side, which leaves us with five. So if you're looking for another confirmation, you could use that. The only real difficulty with D is realizing that we already know delta H standard and delta S standard. We found them in the previous pieces of this problem. We found these numbers. Remember to change this to kilojoules, move the decimal over three spots. That's what they're doing here, by the way. And don't forget to use Kelvin. And of course, if it's standard values, delta G standard and so forth, we're at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. And then just put them in and uh, get the answer. If it's negative for delta G standard, then this is a spontaneous, well, they say it here, or it's thermodynamically favorable because delta G is a negative number. If they want delta G formation for the total, see what's the delta G formation? The next little thing to remember is that the delta G formation values will all add up when done correctly to produce the total, which is what we just found. We know the total delta G for reaction, and the delta G formation values must add up or subtract as a method of adding, so to speak, to the total. They just told us three of them. They just told us two of them, and it looks like we have two unknowns. But you need to remember that the reason that they didn't give us a delta G formation for O2 is that that's the elemental form and the value is zero. So the clue that it's zero is the fact that they didn't tell you. And otherwise, this would have two unknowns. So we're going to do products minus reactants as usual, except for the bond energies. Remember, it seems to always be products minus reactants, except for the bond energies. So we're going to put in four of these and four of those, and two of those, and five of that. Why? Go look at the overall balanced reaction. So in general, what I think of is I keep the signs, except remember, we're subtracting the values of the sum of the reactants. So the sign flips for all the reactants, or you can just say plus and then flip all the signs. That's the same thing. And we know the delta G value for the reaction, and this is X. So the reaction will be spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable at certain temperatures, not necessarily all of them. And in this case, not all of them, definitely, because what we have is a delta H value that's a negative, which is good for this reaction going forward, but a delta S standard value that is a negative, which is bad for this going forward. So what we need to do is realize something a little mathematically. This is a negative, but then we're going to subtract it. So this is going to turn into a positive when I take the negative of a negative. And this is the part working against the idea of this reaction being thermodynamically favorable. What I need to do is suppress the amount of this here. I want the temperatures to be low enough that this doesn't count as much as this. And when that's true, the overall answer for delta G standard will be a negative value. And that's what I'm looking for because I'm looking for when it's thermodynamically favorable. So what I'm going to do is set this to zero because that's the breaking point between positive and negative, obviously, and being thermodynamically favorable, which is a negative value, and not, which is a positive value. So what they've done here, that zero is the delta G. I just put the values in. I personally don't rearrange them first, but you can. Remember that delta G is a zero, and this is the breakover point. Now, again, though, this is not the answer. You must say whether it's greater than, equal to, or less than, and the answer is not equal to. Where delta G standard is a zero, which is what we used, you are at equilibrium, and it wants to go neither forward nor backward, and that is not what we're looking for. Do not leave the answer right here. And one more time, we're trying to look for a value or a set of values where the effect of the delta S standard will be lessened because this is working against the idea of this being thermodynamically favorable. So when I find the breakover point, I want temperatures lower than that because that will bring this value down under the spot where Delta G is such that the reaction is at equilibrium. For 15, first off, just sort of college class note, 
cis and trans just come from Latin roots, meaning this side and other side. So in case you thought it meant something else, uh, actually all those other uses got borrowed from that root meaning and then probably from chemistry itself. So this is the potential energy, which means that the lower the graph goes, the less potential energy it has, which means the more energy has been released. This is the distance between the centers of the nuclei being discussed, and we're discussing the CC bonds in both. So for the trans, delta H total, more energy has been released because it is a more negative number. The change in delta H was more negative, forming the trans than forming the cis. So the trans has less potential energy, less energy left over, more has been released. For the overall delta G standard for reaction value, what we can do is get the delta H standard and the delta S standard, and we get those by doing products minus reactants for both of these, which is illustrated here. Then we can take those values and put them in the overall Gibbs free energy equation for the standard values and get the delta G standard. Don't forget, again, to turn the delta S values into kilojoules by moving the decimal left three spots. So it goes from here to there. The equilibrium constant, then again, will be to take the delta G value and put it into this. You do need to know how to generate this equation from the version given in the book that I did cover this in a previous video. Get some tutoring if you need it. This version is not given in the standard page of values and equations. You're going to have to know how to solve it into this version, at least eventually. You can put the numbers in first, of course, but you need to know how to solve for k, considering that it has natural logs in the equation. Also, don't forget the negative sign in here. So when we have a negative of a negative, we end up with a positive exponent on E.